Welcome to Keith and I Don't Tread on Anyone in the Libertarian Institute. Today, I am joined by Dave DeCamp, the news editor at Antiwar.com and host of Antiwar News with Dave DeCamp. Mr. DeCamp, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thanks for having me, Keith. What does it mean to be anti-war? Well, to me, being anti-war and for us at Antiwar.com, it means more than just you know opposing your government's entry into a war, because usually at that point, it's almost too late. Um, It really means kind of opposing all the policies uh, that can lead up to, you know, the involvement in the war, or as we see with Ukraine right now, you know, funding this proxy war uh, on Russia's border by, you know, funneling billions of dollars in weapons in. Um, And really, for me, it's, you know, non-interventionism is the policy. And that's very uh, reflective in my work and in antiwar.com, we're against sanctions, we're against um, you know, trade wars and things like that. And so it goes beyond just being against, you know, once the hot war starts, uh, just being against that. Um, and it's something that, uh, you know, more Americans need to understand because a lot of people call themselves anti-war because they're against the wars in the Middle East, let's say for now, uh, which is great that more people are against those wars because of what a failure they've been. But at the same time, we have these huge escalations with Russia And China, Cold War style escalations and relations are just souring so much with these two nuclear armed powers. And, you know, people really need to be opposed to this stuff because it's not going to end well for any of us. People will often look at the benefits of war, for example, stopping uh, the German National Socialist Party from expanding throughout Europe, stopping uh, stopping Japanese imperialism and their atrocities, the American Civil War leading to the end of uh, plantation slavery. Uh, What would you say are the costs or the downsides of war that people either completely ignore or don't appreciate the depth of? Well, I mean, you mentioned World War II, which is the one that everybody always goes to. That's the interventionist's, you know, greatest argument for every war is that somebody's the next Hitler. Um, But, you know, and we're really kind of, at least my generation, you know, I'm 32 and and I was raised on World War II movies, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks, World War II movies, and it was kind of glorified to us. But really, World War II was the worst thing that's ever happened in the history of the world. I mean, the scale of death and destruction in such a short time. So the lesson should be how could that have been avoided? And there's many ways, but it always goes back to really World War I and the Treaty of Versailles and trying to you know destroy Germany and punish Germany for what they did. Um, and it's just... You know, I mean, you look at there's so many ways. I, I know you've gone over uh, Pat Buchanan's book, Church, Churchill, Hitler and the Unnecessary War. And and that's it. You know, I'm not it's not just me saying this, some radical anti-war libertarian guy. It's Churchill himself has said, you know, that World War One Treaty of Versailles, why, you know, gave rise to Hitler and, and the events leading up to it didn't all have to happen. Um, so we have to look at these lessons. And if you just look at all these countries that have been totally destroyed by war, And for the United States, we kind of were seemingly unaffected by it uh, until 9-11. And uh, now we're really starting to see the consequences of being a global empire and trying to control the world and sanctioning everybody and uh, inflation. And and, uh, of course, that goes into central banking and everything, uh, which is why I think being libertarian is is the most consistent ideology with being anti-war because of the, the central banking aspect. But Anyway, the cost of it, you know, we're seeing the cost of being a global empire right now, and that's in our rising costs and how nobody can really afford anything. And uh, we're starting to see, I think, really the the decline of the American empire, and it's going to really hurt uh, Americans. Uh, I want to focus on the costs a little more because we see a video in America of Eric Garner getting killed or Kelly Thomas or Tony Timpa. And we say, what a horrible atrocity. This is a person who could have lived and enjoyed life in the absence of, you know, someone just unjustly taking their life. But when it comes to 60 million deaths in the second world war, people say, well, it is what it is. That's, that's what you got to do. Or, you know, the civilians in the Donbass getting killed since 2014, not really important, but the second Russia Uh, goes into Ukraine, obviously, it's uh, hell on earth, which of course is bad, but they have no uh, appreciation for both sides of the issue. They Mm just almost randomly, not so randomly, pick a villain to hate. So when it comes to 
deaths in or when it comes to people losing their limbs, getting PTSD, kids growing up without parents. Uh, what else do people need to really appreciate? So war is not some thing that's in the distant that people in the military focus on. How do you really make the cost real to people and say this matters? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a tough uh, question because it's hard. You think about what our government has done for the past 20 years. Uh, let's just talk about, you know, the terror wars, um, all the civilians uh, that have been killed in that, children and the hospitals that have been bombed by the U.S. and weddings and drone strikes hitting farmers as they're harvesting their crops and just horrors that are really unimaginable to uh, people in the United States. Um, so those types of costs, um, it's just really tough to to get people to understand what that means. And, and it's really amazing, too, how how easily they could shrug it off. I mean, if they understand what, what's happening in, in Yemen right now with the, the Saudi imposed blockade that wouldn't be happening without support from the U.S., that it's just it's a war on the country's most vulnerable because children and, uh, you know, elderly people, sickly people, pregnant women are the ones that are suffering the most from this policy. And it's really, uh, you know, people are starving to death in that country because of a war that the U.S. is imposing on it. And um, you really just you have to try to put the shoe on the other foot sometimes. I mean, you think about what the U.S. is trying to do to Russia when Russia invaded Ukraine. Biden came out and said, uh, you know, that they're going to try to destroy the Russian economy and all that. So just imagine, you know, if, if Putin came out and said that about the U.S., you think <laughs> about how much everybody freaks out about all this, these bogus stories about Russian election interference and stuff, or if China, if, if Xi Jinping came out and said, we're going to make the American economy scream, things like that, like just what the U S imposes on the world. And I know I'm speaking from like a very American perspective when you're answering, asking me these questions. Um, but the costs, uh, it's just, it's something that I think we have to really kind of get out there to people is the destruction and the deaths. And that's something I try to cover all the time about how U S sanctions are, are killing people in other countries because they lose access to specialized medicine and things like that. And it's just such a brutal policy. Um, and it, and it, you know, creates enemies and, and all that. It just, the atrocities are unbelievable people, you know, saving and working their whole lives to buy houses that end up getting bombed. One of my favorite Pat Buchanan moments is uh, he's actually warning about NATO expansion and a potential uh, conflict with Russia because the U.S. is going back on, you know, what uh, James Baker had promised uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, he goes, you know, these sanctions that the uh, U.S. government's uh, imposing around the world, you know, Saddam Hussein, Fidel Castro, Milosevic, they look well fed to me. Who do you think is getting punished by these? And it's so, so typical that, you know, waging war on Putin and, you know, holding Saddam accountable. Well, obviously, Saddam and Gaddafi ended up getting killed. But that's just one person. The massive amounts of, uh, you know, terror that's actually happening is totally innocent people. And, of course, that uh, that never gets any attention. That's why I uh, really appreciate places like uh, antiwar.com. When it comes to uh, politicians making predictions and saying, look, war isn't good, but we need to do it so we get this outcome. Historically, have you found any correlation between the predictions of politicians and real-world outcomes of wars? Well, I mean, you know, just speaking uh, with in, in our, our modern history here, uh, like absolutely no correlation, uh, especially with the terror wars and what they said they wanted to do in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, at every turn, the opposite uh, happened in Afghanistan. Uh, after they changed to regime change, they said, we got to take the Taliban out. Well, when the U.S. left Afghanistan a year ago, the Taliban, they left it, uh, the country. Uh, it's more controlled by the Taliban now than it ever has been before. They never controlled the whole country, but they do now. And now if you look at this economic war that Biden tried to launch against Russia, that's totally backfired. And the, the line was, oh, this is going to help stop the war, deter the war. But that hasn't happened. It's made Putin, uh, it, you know, kind of solidify his his control. And, you know, it gives them a foreign uh, boogeyman to point to to blame for all the problems. And, you know, going, we could go back further during the Cold War. I mean, you think about the domino theory with uh, Korea and Vietnam. And how Vietnam was just a total disaster. And then, the, you know, the communists ended up controlling the entire country, again, similar to Afghanistan after all that. And um, it's just, 
uh, the promises that they make. Uh, go back to World War One. I. I mean, that was about democracy, right? Wasn't that about spreading democracy across the world? And it gave rise to Nazism and Bolshevism. Um, so I think there's a lot of examples like that if you go back in history. And the rise of Mussolini. Don't strip mm -hmm. him of, uh, of Mussolini credit. And of course, uh, <laughs> d domino theory didn't account for Hong Kong and Singapore being two of the most capitalist places on, uh, on the planet, uh, places that uh, the U.S. Uh, can learn a lot from. Mm -hmm. What do people need to know about the 9-11 attacks? Well, you know, we just had the anniversary and it does seem like a lot. There's just so many more people now willing to say and that recognize that it was you know, blowback. It was the war coming home. We talk about these policies and, and one of the most brutal things that happened throughout the 1990s was the U.S. sanctions and bombing campaign against Iraq. There's this PBS documentary. You're talking about people saving up to buy their houses. And I have to find this clip. I saw it on the Internet somewhere. and I, I got to seek it out. But, you know, they're interviewing these Iraqi middle class people that are dressed like you and me uh, in these little suburban homes. And they're just saying how they've lost, they're losing everything as a result of the U.S. sanctions, uh, you know, post Gulf War and just what we did to that country. Uh, and, you know, that was a major, major motiv motivation for bin Laden, as he made very clear, as well as U.S. support for Israel. And uh, we just have to remember that it, it wasn't just some freak attack. And also we have to keep in mind that there are still unanswered questions questions about 9-11, especially now where recently more stuff came out about how Saudi Arabia gave material support to the two Al-Qaeda, to the two hijackers that were in the country. Um, you know, when they came in, they got help from the Saudi embassy and stuff like that. And we know that the CIA knew that these two guys were in the country and they didn't tell the FBI. Um, and, you know, I'm not uh, saying because there's so much misinformation that was put out in, when it comes to 9-11 and the, like the truther movement, all this stuff. Oh, there was no planes. Uh, there were holograms. Uh, it's really been uh, flooded with misinformation. And I, I think, you know, that might have been a purposeful strategy because people look at anybody who questions the, the official story as one of those kooks. But really, there are a lot of questions, you know, to be asked. And especially just really, it's either... Uh, more so about the failure of the CIA and the FBI, how they couldn't prevent it when it, all the pieces were there. Yeah, well, uh, no planes and holograms is still more likely than uh, they hate us for our freedoms. <laughs> yeah, when it comes <laughs> when it comes to sanctions on Iraq, this is a very fast one that uh, the neocons will often play. Giuliani touched on it when uh, he was on stage with Ron Paul. He goes, "I've never heard that before. Nine eleven happened because we went into Iraq." Well, when into Iraq is what people associate with something that happened a few years after 9-11. So he's making it seem like Ron Paul's argument is 9-11 happened because years later we went into Iraq, which is just totally bonkers. It is widely not known by the average person that there were sanctions. What are sanctions and why were they imposed on Iraq by uh, the U.S. and U.N. in the 90s? Walk us through that history. Well, yeah, so, the you know, they were imposed on Iraq, you know, the idea was to pressure them to get rid of Saddam and they who they accused of having weapons of mass destruction. Um, and throughout the 90s, I mean, there are, I believe, two U.N. officials who were, you know, stationed in Iraq who were in charge of that policy that resigned. And one of them called the policy genocide, the, the sanctions campaign. And uh, it was also a bombing campaign. I mean, um, they bombed Iraq throughout the 90s. And this is things, you know, for me, for my personal you know, journey into becoming anti-war and, and doing what I do. Like, I had no idea about any that, that whole situation until I was, you know, in my 20s. I, I didn't realize what the U.S. did to Iraq. And, um, you know, especially they target, you know, wastewater treatment plants and, and things like that. They target the civilian infrastructure in these attacks, which is a tactic that the U.S. uses in just about all of its wars, going back to World War II, you know, bombing civilian infrastructure. They did it in Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Iraq during the Gulf War and after. Um, and it's just such a brutal policy uh, that, um, yeah, yeah, like Giuliani just kind of inferring that we weren't doing anything to them, I think speaks to the, the attitude um, that, 
uh, American U S politicians have, it was kind of this thing. Um, you know, I was pretty young in the nineties, but just from looking back at clips and, and C-SPAN and stuff, you know, Ron Paul was really the only one saying, Hey, we should probably not be bombing Iraq. This is going to come back to bite us. Um, but it seemed like it was just kind of in the background for most people. So we have the civilians and it also goes back to the first world war when Lord Admiralty at the time, Winston Churchill blockaded uh, German civilians from getting food because of uh, the crimes of their governments. So uh, the sanctions in Iraq and then, uh, and that was being done from uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, why were there bases in Saudi Arabia? And if they were, uh, and if the bases existed, doesn't that mean that the Saudi Arabian government wanted uh, them there? Well, yeah, that's a good point because that was another one of bin Laden's, uh, th one of the things he cited for the, for why he turned, why the U S became his, his target, you know, after the Soviet union collapsed and, uh, they built those bases to, uh, launch the war against Iraq to launch a war on the Arabian peninsula. Um, so that's why it was such a sensitive, uh, thing for uh not just bin laden not just extreme you know extremists like him but for for muslims in general you know it's their holy place in the u.s it turned into a, a hub of the u.s war machine and they were supposed to just be temporary bases but they st they stayed there throughout the 90s um and again it was one of the main factors into uh al-qaeda starting to attack the u.s and then uh support for Israel. Uh, who were the first countries to recognize Israel uh, going back to May of 1948? Well, yeah, that was, uh, I mean, the, the British and the, the U.S. and it was the U.N. mandate that created Israel as a country. And it they drove out uh, the Palestinians when it was first created. About 750,000 people were driven from their, their homes and what they call the Nakba in Palestine, the catastrophe. And that uh, thousands of others were also killed, people that didn't leave. And that was, you know, they created a country on top of uh, Palestine, which was a country. And that's another thing that, that just gets lost in, uh, I think, for me personally, another thing I just really had no knowledge of and that they don't teach in uh, public schools in the U.S. at least is how, you know, I just was under the impression that Israel was there forever, but it wasn't. And it was created by this mandate and, uh, you know, there's just a long history of the, um, you know, crimes that have been committed against the Palestinians since then. And th just that was, of course, such a another big factor in the war coming home. When it comes to uh, Israel and Palestine today, what is the nature of the situation? Because you can say, well, a long time ago, the Palestinians did some bad things. The Israelis did. And let's just call it even. And today, Israel uh, is mainly the good guys because they're very westernized. No, a lot of them come over to America. They have their own organization, American Israeli Political Action Committee. Israel's very legitimate. Palestinians are the the savage people with rockets and who uh, use humans as uh, uh, as uh, human shields. So when it comes to that narrative, what are uh, people missing about Israel Palestine today? Well, right now, you know, you hear a lot about a two state solution, and kind of what's implied is that the Palestinians don't want a two state solution, but that leaves out a huge part of the situation is that in the West Bank, there's slowly Israel is slowly expanding into the West Bank through settlements. There's already a lot of settlements there. If you look at the map um, of, you know, Trump, the Trump administration put forward what I think he called the deal of the century or something, this peace plan for a two state solution. But it would have, uh, you know, the West Bank looked like Swiss cheese, like the, the territory that Palestine would have gotten because all these settlements would have become Israeli territory and there would be Israeli only access roads. Really, it would have uh, formalized apartheid rule because there would be all these roads and stuff that the Palestinians couldn't access, um, which is already the case. But, you know, it just would have formalized everything, like I said, and there would have been a tunnel to the Gaza Strip. And that's a big part of why there hasn't been a two state solution or anything like that. And it's not really a feasible solution now because of the settlement expansion and it's continued. They keep approving new settlements under Trump. They, they approved a record amount and they're demolishing Palestinian homes, demolishing villages to build these settlements. And um, on top of that, you have Gaza, which is a small little enclave of a few million people that is under siege. It's been under blockade since 2000 and end of 2006 into 2007. 
And when we see Israel launch a bombing campaign, you know, the, the narrative is that Israel is defending itself from terrorists in Gaza, but the people of Gaza are under siege. I mean, that's if you want to look at international law, I'm not trying to justify anything. You know, a country that's under siege, under blockade, has the right to defend itself. So technically, the people in Gaza do have under international law have the right to defend themselves. And of course, the way they do it is indiscriminate because they fire these rockets. But they're just so crude compared to the weapons that Israel gets. Uh, a lot of them from the U.S. and this Iron Dome system they have that shoots down all these rockets. And then Israel bombs the hell out of Gaza every once in a while and always kills children because it's one of the most densely populated places on the planet. And uh, it's just a it's a horror show over there in Gaza. And, you know, you always hear these numbers about uh, just how unsustainable it is, how they're they don't have any clean drinking water and stuff like that. Um, so the situation and the unemployment, I remember I was always like pretty shocked by the unemployment rate in Gaza. It's about 50 percent. And for young people, it gets up into like 70 percent. I mean, imagine being in your early 20s and living there and you can't go anywhere and there's no just no prospects for anything. It's just such a bleak uh, existence for them. What do people need to know about the relations between U.S., Taiwan and China? Well, this is a big one now because things are starting to really heat up. Um, and just going back the history of it, you know, the U.S. backed Chiang Kai-shek and his Kuomintang uh, it, it, in the Chinese Civil War, which officially ended in 1949 when Mao and the communists won, and Chiang Kai-shek fled to the island of Taiwan. And then in the 1950s, there were some Chinese attempts at taking out outer islands, um, not the island of Taiwan exactly, but Taiwan also controls some very small islands on the mainland. They still do to this day. And, you know, the U.S. intervened twice in the 1950s when Mao tried to take those territories. And, you know, the U.S. Navy, uh, Eisenhower sent the Navy in. And at the time, in both cases, the U.S. military planners were pushing to nuke China because they didn't have nuclear weapons at that point. So this is history. And there's a lot to it. Um, but really, the current situation as it stands today, exists really because of the U.S. intervention in the Chinese Civil War. Now, I don't think Mao had the capabilities to launch an invasion of the island of Taiwan at the time, but the situation would have would be very different if not for the U.S. intervention. And now, so the U.S., after Mao won, the U.S. didn't recognize China. They recognized Taiwan, the Republic of China, as China, and they had a seat at the U.N. and everything. And then that changed in the 1970s when Nixon went over there. He shook hands with Mao. And then that led towards normalization, which was formalized in 1979. In 79, the U.S. severed diplomatic ties with Taipei, which is Taiwan, and opened up with Beijing. And since then, the U.S. has pursued what they call the strategic ambiguity policy. And really, the one China policy that the U.S. follows is that they don't have formal relations with Taiwan. They do sell them some weapons. Uh, they have good relations with Beijing um, until recently, but for the over the decades, big trade relations and really helped build China up. Um, and but now that's that's all changing, and that has changed significantly in the past few years. And it really started under Trump because part of this policy is that you know the U.S. doesn't send officials to Taiwan. They don't have a, an embassy. They don't have official relations. And we saw under Trump, he started sending cabinet officials there. He, he sent his health secretary there, which might seem kind of like it's insignificant, but it was the highest level U.S. official, you know, cabinet official to visit Taiwan since 79 in decades and decades. And that really started uh, escalating tensions around the island. We saw more Chinese flights in the region. A few years later, that stuff has kind of continued more congressional delegations. And now we just saw Nancy Pelosi go in early August. She visited Taiwan and she's the Speaker of the House. So for China's, from their perspective, she's the third highest official in the U.S. government. And it's a big signal of the U.S. moving away from the one China policy, which so China's stance is that they want reunification, what they call reunification with Taiwan. And they want it to be peaceful. That's what they say. But they oh, they don't rule out using military force. And the thing that they say will make them use military force is 
foreign support for what they call Taiwan's independence forces. And we've seen explicit warnings from Chinese officials over the past year as the U.S. has been increasing support for Taiwan. They say, U.S., if you support Taiwan independence, it's going to lead to war between the U.S. and China. And it's, it's a confusing thing because Taiwan, even right now with the ruling Democratic Progressive Party, if that the DPP, Tsai Ing-wen is the president, and their independence leaning, but they have not formally declared uh, independence. Technically, Taiwan, they act as an independent nation and they are, you know, in everything that they do, but they still are technically part of China and, and haven't declared independence. But if they do declare independence, China says that that's when they'll move. And the U.S. support in that direction could also lead them to attacking Taiwan because they a, an invasion of Taiwan would be the biggest amphibious invasion in the history of war. And, and it would, you know, China doesn't want to do it. It would be very costly for them. But again, it, the thing that will make it more likely is the U.S. support for Taiwan. And we just saw the Senate. Uh, Foreign Relations Committee just advanced this bill that would give Taiwan $6.5 billion in military aid, which is huge. They've, n n they've never given Taiwan anything like that. And it would. there is also other things in the bill that would really change uh, the relationship. And China, after Pelosi visited, China launched its largest ever military exercises around the island ever. Uh, it simulated a blockade, and they've been keeping up the pressure. They're flying planes across the Taiwan Strait just about every day now. And this is big changes that are, that are happening. Um, and it's funny because they usually kind of overplay uh, China's military drills around Taiwan, the, the Western media. But after Pelosi's visit, because it was so obviously like a U.S. provocation that they're responding to, it hasn't been kind of covered uh, in the proper light, I don't think. I mean, this is a huge deal. And the, the road we're going down is very, very similar to what happened with Ukraine and NATO expansion. Of course, uh, they can't stop uh, murders in Chicago. Murder rates are uh, skyrocketing in major cities, but uh, they're really going to uh, protect Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of uh, protecting everywhere except uh, the places they've taken an oath to protect, the Donbass region. What do people need to know about NATO, Ukraine, the Donbass, and Russia? Yeah, I mean, really, you know, just to go back again, in, in modern history, people just need to know what happened in Ukraine in 2014, which was uh, the U.S. supported the ousting of Viktor Yanukovych, Ukrainian president. And there was the Euromaidan protests that were sparked by Yanukovych kind of scrapping his this plan to sign a trade deal with the EU. And they started these protests. And, um, you know, since Russia invaded on February 24th, we've been getting a lot of pushback to characterize that 2014 incident as a coup. But, you know, if you look at the definition of a coup, it's a sudden uh, violent change of power. And what happened in Ukraine was that there was these protests for months. And uh, while this was happening, I mean, John McCain was there speaking to the protesters, Chris Murphy, all these American officials, Victoria Nuland, uh, who was in Obama state department at the time. She, she played Lindsey in, Graham, Amy Lin Klobuchar. Yeah, yeah. All these people were going over there. Um, and then there was a deal worked out between the opposition and Yanukovych that was brokered by the EU. But then the more far right, uh, what they consider far right in Ukraine parties uh, didn't accept it. And they called for him to step down immediately and they stormed government buildings and then he fled Russia. Um, so just that's what happened. And it was supported by the U S and of course there's, there's the leaked phone call. A lot of your listeners probably know this stuff about the Ukraine coup. I'm sure uh, between Victoria Nuland and Jeffrey uh, Piat, who was the U uh, S ambassador to Ukraine at the time, right before the change, basically saying who should be in the next Ukrainian government. And then look who is, uh, you know, those people made up the next government. Um, so this sparked the war in the Donbass because the people, that lived in the Donbass and other places in Ukraine rejected the post-coup government and including in Crimea and Russia annexed Crimea. And there was a referendum. It was, it's something like 97% they say of people in Crimea voted to join Russia. So people always say it was a sham referendum. But if you look at polling before that happened, I mean, years going back years since, uh, uh, before it happened and after it happened, the people in Crimea overwhelmingly wanted to join Russia and are happy that they did. And 
the, what really demonstrates that is that Russia took Crimea without firing a shot. Um, I think there was like a few people died, but it was like an, if you look at the Wikipedia article, but it was like, a, it was like an accident or something. Um, but so that's lost in the, in the narrative since Russia invaded and also the war in the Donbass. There's two uh, oblasts in that region, two provinces, the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, and they declared independence from Kiev after the coup. They wanted to secede. And that sparked a war. Ukraine didn't want them to go. And there was a brutal war in the Donbass for years. It was at a stalemate most of the time leading up to the invasion, but about 14,000 people died, a lot of civilians. And that, you know, so... Uh, this is a war on Russia's border. And we've seen learned from recent reporting that the U.S. deployed CIA operatives to the front lines of the Donbass war to train them. And NATO was in the country training um, troops. And there was huge NATO military exercises in Ukraine. Um, so, yeah, people just need to know how involved the U.S. was in all of this uh, and not just the coup, not just the war, just all the whole situation. So would this have been with Poroshenko's government or with the Svoboda party? Like, are they directly involved with the major government or are they sort of working behind the scenes? Um, you mean the more like right wing, like Svoboda and stuff like how influential are they? You mean, uh, is the U S government uh, explicitly working with the government or is it like these NGOs, like the guy in Belarus is saying that America doesn't come in and say, we, the CIA want this new thing. What their current scam is, I think his name is Lukashenko. Mm -hmm. uh, what the, what they do is they use NGOs mm -hmm. as sort of proxies to sort of get the regime change operation uh, set in motion. Uh, yeah. Is that what's happening or is it direct uh, support? Poroshenko's on the phone with Obama. Here's what's going down. Or John Brennan. Well, at that point, it was uh, a little bit of both because, you know, in the events leading up to the coup, it was definitely the NGOs played a major role and you see them all over the world. I mean, and if you, you could go to the, any, the National Endowment for Democracy, which is one of the big ones, you could go to their website and type in a country and it shows the, the, all these programs that they're mm -hmm. funding. And one example I always think of, because I was writing about Bolivia and, and, and that they were directly funding, um, you know, these like this opposition to the to the president that this this group that wanted to secede and, and declare independence from Morales. And, you know, so that is the NED is funded by the U.S. government. So it's it is how the U.S. does it these days. You know, they famously said when the NED started, I forget what official it was. It was a CIA official who said that the NED is going to do, uh, you know, openly what we did covertly, uh, you know, for the past few decades. Um, but in Ukraine now, I mean, all those NGOs were involved and, but it, it was also direct uh, involvement, especially, you know, after the coup, I mean, it was uh, the U S training Ukraine for this war and NATO training them, you know, they, they never joined NATO, but sort of became a de facto NATO member in a way because of all this support and joint drills and stuff. Um, so yeah, it became more openly, uh, much more open the U S involvement in Ukraine after the coup. So if you were, uh, advising Bill Clinton in 1999, when Putin asked Clinton, if Russia could join NATO, what would you have uh, told Clinton to do? Um, I mean, if NATO was still going to be around and, you know, I would have told him to, abolish NATO. But if it was still going to exist, I, I would have said, you know, you could let them join. I mean, that was the idea was to get to let Russia become, you know, a part of Europe, as they say, and and, and Ukraine. And this is, you know, a realist point of view uh, that, you know, people that believe in the, you know, the State Department and the American Empire and stuff. Henry Kissinger has said this, that he said this at the time that Ukraine should serve as a bridge between Europe and Russia. And that it shouldn't be used as a wedge uh, against Russia, and that's what it became. And that's and William Burns, who's the current head of the CIA, in 2008, when uh, Ukraine was was promised that it would eventually become a NATO member, he he warned in in a in a in a memo that was released by WikiLeaks, basically what would happen. They said this this would probably spark a civil war in Ukraine, and Russia would intervene, and that's what happened. And that's another point. I mean, with the Donbass war and the view from Russia, 
because people should know what the Russian, you know, nationalists and supporters of the war think, you know, to them, this is Putin, this is Russia finishing that war in the Donbass. Um, and it's a war against the U S and NATO. And that's how they view it. And, um, you just need to understand how dangerous yeah. it is too. And, and just where we are now, it's, it's really amazing to me that it got escalated this far. I didn't think we would be at this point in 2022 funneling all this money into a war against Russia. When it comes to U S relations with Iran, what do people need to know? Well, right now, I mean, things are really uh, not looking good with, with Iran and, um, what people need to know now is that the nuclear deal that the Trump administration withdrew from and they imposed all these sanctions back on Iran, um, that that was really a policy driven by Israel. Now, of course, the Republicans, the right wingers, they were against the Iran deal and stuff. But the, the real opponent of it and the one that just looks like they just sabotaged uh, a return to this deal, because it looked like for a minute there that the Biden administration might have signed a deal with Iran. Israel is really pushing against this. They, they want to keep up this uh, kind of cold war with Iran that they have, which involves covert attacks inside Iran against Iran's nuclear program. And there's really no reason for the U.S. to for Iran to be an enemy at this point. I mean, it goes back to the coup uh, in the 1953 coup that the CIA backed and the Islamic Revolution was a response to that. And that's why the hostage crisis happened, because the coup in the 50s was orchestrated from the U.S. Embassy. That's why they stormed the embassy. So that's important context. But really, since then, you know, since the 80s um, and the bombing in, in Lebanon that killed uh, Marines, you know, Iran could be tied to that. Since then, they haven't really done anything uh, major against the U.S. And as Scott Horton has put it, and I think he put it very well, that the worst thing that Iran did in Iraq was take advantage of the U.S. Uh, invasion. Um you know, really how much that invasion benefited Iran and, and gave their friends power um, just shows the short sightedness. And you're talking earlier about how politicians pr just predict the wrong thing uh, with Iraq. I mean, we how much that invasion helped Iran. But right now, um, all this scaremongering about their nuclear program is just totally ridiculous. There's no indication right now that they'll that they're going to build a bomb. And I would say if I thought there was, but right now, I don't think that there is. They've explicitly uh, forbidden it by their religion, by, a, you know, uh, it's a fatwa, which is a religious edict. They cannot make weapons of mass destruction. And but what's happening here is that uh, is really the, something that people need to understand is that Israel has a secret nuclear weapons program. They have nuclear weapons. They have a few hundred nuclear warheads. Because another big part of the narrative is that if Iran gets a bomb, it's going to start an arms race in the region. Well, Israel already has has nukes and Iran doesn't. And that because once you understand that, then you kind of start questioning this whole entire narrative of, wait, why is Israel so concerned about Iran getting nukes? And why do I always hear about that when Israel has these nukes and, and we don't even know about it? And Israel's always constantly attacking Iran. I mean assassinating people inside Iran. It just happened this past May. They gunned down an IRGC colonel in, in the capital. And uh, we, and Donald Trump assassinated Soleimani. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and that was for Israel. I mean, that that there was no national interest in killing Soleimani. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. So when it comes to the day of 9-11, um, Donald Rumsfeld talking about uh, potentially... Uh, in his memos uh, saying uh, we could use this to not just go after bin Laden, but also after Saddam. It seems like uh, anytime Israel has a big rival in the region, Saddam in the early 2000s, Iran today, we haven't gotten a lot of the, the U.S. going after Hezbollah in Lebanon or anything. But anytime there's this big major uh, rival in the region that the Israeli regime sort of uses the American regime and the American regime is happy to go along because of whether it's Halliburton connections or just increasing their social status or just having an enemy to fight. You almost have this symbiotic relationship between these evil ruling classes that uh, are able to operate at the expense of 
everyone else. Is that really what's happening? This smaller country is pulling in this bigger country using its leverage? Yeah, to an extent, uh, I think so. And it is also about uh, control and power. I mean, the U.S. wants to dominate the region and control the oil resources more so. I mean, if you look back at what the neocons said in the 1990s, I mean, Dick Cheney said this, um, that because now the the U.S. could be totally relying on itself uh, for oil, that it's more about keeping the resource out of China's hands is the, the control that they want over the Middle East or another, you know, uh, adversary, let's say. Um, so there's definitely an aspect of power about it. But and right. If you look at what's happening right now, you know, the U.S. has scaled back a lot from the Middle East. And that's not to downplay the wars that are still going on, the war in Yemen. The U.S. is still in Syria, in Iraq, and Biden was just bombing Syria, just launched just a little escalation in Syria. We're lucky that didn't spiral bigger. But And, and in Syria, who was that? Would that be against uh, Islamic uh, state fighters or uh, Bashar al-Assad's regime? The latest airstrikes, they yeah. were against what the U.S. called Iran-backed fighters. So there are Shia militias inside Syria that actually helped the U.S. They were, they were on the same side in the fight against ISIS. So when the war against ISIS was really over, when they were obliterated by Trump, um, they kind of turned around and started waging this uh, low-intensity war against these Shia militias. And that's what led to Soleimani being killed. The series of events was really sparked by that. Um, but Biden said that because there's rocket attacks on, on U.S. bases in Syria and Iraq once in a while. And they always say, oh, it's Iran's friends and we have to bomb them. And I know one target was this. I forget the name, but it's a Shia militia. They're actually Afghan. So they're uh, Afghans that have traveled there to help fight ISIS and stuff. And all these groups, some of them receive support from Iran, uh, but it varies by group. And, and they, they clash sometimes and they don't always get along. They butt heads with Iran sometimes. Really, what's interesting is that Iran was trying to get these Shia militias in Iraq to stop attacking the U.S., to stop launching rocket attacks in the U.S. because they wanted to cool tensions, but they didn't want to listen to Iran. Um, so, but those were the latest strikes. And it, and it seemed like what Biden did there, I mean, I don't see any other reason for those strikes if it wasn't because it was when negotiations with the U.S. and Iran, it seemed like a deal was going to be signed. And then Biden launched these airstrikes. So it seemed like it might have been some sort of message to Iran or just a way to kind of escalate tensions and kind of kill the deal because he doesn't really want to return to it. Um, but just a completely useless escalation if you really just look at the facts. Because um, they said it was for some rocket attack a few weeks earlier, but nobody was injured or killed in it. It was mi very minor. And he went and killed a few uh, people. Um, so that's what is going on in Syria. I mean, Syria is another, it's a big uh, messy situation that um, the U.S. is involved in, if you want to talk about that. Well, uh, this is another example of uh, blowback. Omar Mateen went to a nightclub in Orlando and murdered more or less uh, 50 uh, people, got on the phone with uh, the 911 operator and said five times explicitly, the U.S. and Russia are murdering civilians in Syria and Iraq. This has to stop. Uh, the bombing needs to stop. The airstrikes are killing women. They're killing children. This is horrible. And uh, b both Trump and... Uh, Ob uh, and Obama get out and just lie about it. So even these uh, wars that we don't hear about, we uh, still have to pay the price for the uh, crimes of the American ruling class. So uh, Syria war, not that popular. People are not that passionate about. The holy war in uh, my generation was the invasion of Afghanistan. What do people, before getting into the Afghan sanctions of recent, first talk us uh, tell us what we need to know about the initial invasion and uh, Afghan war. Yeah, well, this was another thing, you know, just growing up, uh, even when I started becoming like more anti-war, I always thought, oh, well, Afghanistan was like the necessary war because they did 9-11 and we had to go over there and, and, and you know, but um, really what I mean, what Scott lays out in his book, Fool's Errand, uh, in the beginning is that he makes a strong circumstantial case that when the U.S. first invaded Afghanistan, that they let bin Laden go at Tora Bora. And there's not if you that's the best case that I've seen for that um, theory. And, it, and it's a pretty strong one. And now another thing I remember 
listening to somebody on a podcast say this is years ago and again growing up as a post 9-11 teenager and thinking the afghan war was necessary i remember hearing somebody say oh the, the taliban they were they would have they were willing to hand over bin laden and i was like what that's not true and i went on google and i just searched taliban says they'll hand over bin laden and just article after article at from 2001 from september 2001 from october 2001 that the Taliban said first, uh, you know, oh, well, if you show us evidence, we'll hand them to a third country to stand trial. Or at first it was, we'll put them on trial and then we'll hand them to a third country. And and then it just kind of came back to me that we, you know, we won't negotiate with terrorists. There will be no negotiations. And it's like, oh, that's what that was all about. And then in I think it was in 2002, there was that clip of Bush, a reporter asked him, uh, so when are, are we going to get bin Laden? Like, what's next? And he's like, oh, well, it's not really about bin Laden. You know, it's about a, it's bigger than him. And just looking back on that stuff, it's like, wow, you see how it was, how they just used 9-11 as an excuse to launch this huge war in Afghanistan against the Taliban. It became regime change. There was even uh, uh, a deal with the Taliban in December that would have pretty much disbanded their rule. But uh, Rumsfeld rejected that. And that was in December 2001. There's a New York Times article about it. Looking back on this stuff as I as I was uh, it was just so pivotal for me, like really understanding that it the Afghan war was totally unnecessary. And of course, staying there and nation building, you know, it's easy to say that that was uh, a waste and unnecessary, just how the, how quickly the government collapsed. But the initial, the whole entire thing didn't have to happen. There could have been, a, you know, post 9-11 could have negotiated with the Taliban to get bin Laden. Or could have been a quick raid to kill him. I mean, even if he got away, they destroyed what was what Al Qaeda was uh, very quickly, and they could have left after that. But no, they they stayed and they had to turn it into this nation building exercise and spend trillions of dollars. Exactly. Uh, there are a. It's amazing the sources that Scott uses in Fool's Errand. White House says no to Taliban demand for proof. September 21st, 2001, CBC News. U.S. refusal of 2001 Taliban offer gave bin Laden a free pass. Intern press. ABC News, October 14th. U.S. rejects new Taliban offer. I mean, it is just unbelievable how that was hidden from us. Um, George Bush wrote a book, allegedly, called <laughs> Decision Points. And he goes, we had little faith that uh, the, the Taliban would hand him over after we demanded that they hand him over. But we needed that to increase the likelihood that uh, we'd be able to get the international community to support us in going to Afghanistan. I don't have the direct quote. It's in a chapter titled Afghanistan. And he doesn't say we asked for uh, them to hand him over and they offered, but we couldn't do it because of the he doesn't even say that they took him up on the offer. And mm -hmm. this whole thing could have been avoided. They're constantly in search for enemies. So we then replaced the Taliban with the Taliban. Now there are Afghan sanctions. What uh, get, talk us uh, talk to us about the nature of the sanctions that uh, the U.S. regime put on Afghanistan since 2021? Yeah. So there's really two things to discuss here, and um, the first is the Afghan central bank assets. So the U.S. froze seven billion in Afghan central bank reserves that were held in the U.S. and uh, other countries. They froze another few billion. And so what happened there was that you know the U.S. built up this government, and with it, it was an infrastructure in Kabul mostly, but in elsewhere and government workers, and they provided services in Afghanistan uh, because of the war and because of other reasons. It's a very poor country, and people were in really dire need for help. Um, and by seizing this money, they really kind of pulled that infrastructure out from under them. And, you know, there's an argument, I guess, that I've heard, you know, Rand Paul make that, oh, well, it, it was our money to begin with, so we should just keep it from them. But when you look at the situation in Afghanistan, I mean, I think, uh, you know, trying to just take this thing that we set up from them, you know, it, it's it would the right thing to do would be to just release the funds. And, you know, the Taliban is the government now, which is why the U.S. big part of the reason why they don't want to do it. But um, it's just they're really being sore losers here. I mean, they left billions of dollars in military equipment behind. Um, they can't just let them have what is rightfully Afghanistan's, uh, you know, money. 
And also the sanctions on the Taliban. So the Taliban are all under sanctions, the, the, the group, all their leadership, U.S. and U.N. sanctions. And so now the Taliban is the government in Afghanistan. So that means that the country is under uh, sanctions about as as intense as they could be uh, sanctions like that are on Iran, Venezuela and places like that. So that discourages discourages uh, banks, international banks and companies from doing any business with Afghanistan. So U.S. sanctions technically have exemptions for, you know, humanitarian goods and aid and medicine and things like that. But history has shown us, and there was just a UN report about this in Iran, how those exemptions don't really do anything because the US has to issue like a special license. So if you're a company, you're just not going to bother doing business with these countries that are under these heavy sanctions because it's too much of a headache. You have to worry about violating sanctions. And if you want to do it, you have to get this special license from the US. Um, so as Af Afghanistan is facing this really bad food crisis, food shortages everywhere, millions of people facing starvation. And these sanctions are making uh, the delivery of aid harder, the UN says. And um, it's just really, uh, it's turned into an economic war against the people of Afghanistan. Now, when it comes to Al Qaeda in uh, other countries, uh, mostly in Yemen. Obama gets in uh, in 2009, and he says that there was a justification to increase airstrikes on AQAP, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, because the majority of people in Guantanamo Bay were from Yemen. So we got to fight al-Qaeda, not just in one place. They are in a number of countries. So uh, from like the USS Cole bombing in 2000, you know, Bush is working with President Saleh. Obama increases strikes uh, against AQAP. Something happens in 2015 where the U.S. no longer is just going to war against AQAP in Yemen. Walk us through what happened there. Well, yeah, so that was um, in 2015 was the year that the U.S. backed the Saudi-led coalition. Um, you know, it's called the Saudi-led coalition, but it's really they, they wouldn't really be able to, to do this war without the U.S. They need support from the U.S. But it's a coalition of the Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are the most involved, but also, you know, Bahrain and, and uh, even Jordan is involved and stuff. Um but that was after the Houthis took power in North Yemen and they drove out the the um, Saudi backed government, the U.S. backed government and Hadi, the president, he fled to Saudi Arabia. And so the U.S. backed this war against the Houthis. But what's interesting about the Houthis is that they are an enemy of Al Qaeda. And just a few months before, in March 2015, was when the Obama administration announced that they were going to back this war and it's and the Saudis launched the war just a few months before that in January, there was a reporting in the wall street journal and other outlets that the U S was starting to share intelligence with the Houthis to help them fight Al Qaeda. So then they turn around and switch sides really. And because the UAE there's been extensive reporting from AP or there's a 2018 report from AP about it. 2019 report from CNN about it, for, of, of all places, of how the U.S. war, uh, of how, you know, they're backing al-Qaeda linked militants that the, the UAE is uh, more so than anybody else in, in southern Yemen there, and, and how weapons that they're selling to Saudi Arabia and the UAE are ending up in the hands of al-Qaeda. So at the same time, uh, when Trump came in, he actually really escalated the drone war against Al Qaeda in Yemen, as well as ramping up support for the Saudis. So that just shows what a mess uh, U.S. foreign policy is. You know that raid when he uh, first came into office that killed Al Alakwi, the young girl whose brother was killed a few years earlier by Obama in a drone strike. That was a raid supposed to be a raid against Al Qaeda, um, and. So, yeah, I mean, it's just a total mess. But really, by backing this coalition uh, that use Al Qaeda guys to fight the Houthis, <laughs> you're on the side of Al Qaeda in this war. So even though Al Qaeda is the enemy, they're on their side in Yemen. Uh, we know from Jake Sullivan's emails uh, that uh, Al Qaeda and the U.S. are fighting on the same side uh, sometimes against uh, Bashar al-Assad's regime and uh, with uh, Soleimani and Iran depending on which day of the week it is, apparently. Yeah. Is it true that LIFG, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, is uh, um, Al-Qaeda in 
Libya, and the U.S. took their side against Muammar Gaddafi? Um, yeah, I mean, that's another thing that came to light uh, after the U.S. involvement in Libya was how involved al-Qaeda was in that initial stages of that war. Um, so, yeah, we've seen this all over the place. And I mean, right now, still in Syria, in Idlib province in the north, that's still controlled by Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, HTS, who are their formerly uh, al-Nusra front, which was al-Qaeda in Syria. I mean, they're al-Qaeda. They, they're trying to pretend like they're not anymore, um, but they, they're they an al-Qaeda group. And the U.S., there's another, uh, there's other groups. Haras al-Din is one of them that are more, uh, they're another al-Qaeda affiliate that the U.S. targets in drone strikes in Idlib. So they target this one group, but then it's just such a mess because <laughs> HTS is sort of, is backed by Turkey, um, not, uh, openly, but if you look at what Turkey does in that region, they definitely have helped HTS. And the U.S. kind of nominally, uh, quietly backs what Turkey's doing in that part of Syria, but then they're against what Turkey's doing against the Kurds in northeast Syria just over here. I mean, it's just such a mess, and it just shows how uh, messy the foreign intervention can get. And when you find yourself in multiple countries backing the people that are supposed to be our enemy that were responsible for 9-11. I mean, it's just such a disaster. One of the most difficult things to do uh, is to wrap your head around uh, people in large scale, involved in large scale institutions, people with a lot of money, a lot of power and a lot of fame, them being really, really wrong. Not just like a little bit away from the bullseye, but like 50 kilometers in the other direction. So when it comes to why are so many of these wars occurring? If the anti-war position is right, shouldn't it have caught on globally and governments uh, uh, no longer being able to wage war? How is it that war is able to survive if you have so many good arguments against it? Well, I mean, it's just, you know, if, if we want to get back to uh, more of a libertarian view of it, and, you know, I always think of war is the health of the state, which was the essay by Randolph Bourne. And it just, you see how powerful a state grows in war and how much more power they gain, especially after 9-11, the Patriot Act. Um, just a few obvious examples in modern history. And also now with the U.S., how intertwined the arms industry is, the military industrial complex. I mean, there's just so much money to be made here. And sometimes I think it might just be as simple as that. Right now and, and today for the U.S., I mean, with what's happening in Ukraine, they're spending tens of billions of dollars on this war, sending weapons to Ukraine. Uh, and then part of that is replenishing the weapons that they're sending to Ukraine. And also the European countries are now buying more American weapons because they're worried about Russia. And it's just this cycle, uh, never ending cycle of just money, money. And now Taiwan, they're going to give them billions in aid each year. I mean, it's corporate welfare. It's just so uh obvious and on the face of it that I think right now, I think it is as simple as that. I mean, Lloyd Austin is Biden's secretary of defense. He was on the board of Raytheon before he uh, joined the Biden administration. And that happened under Trump too. James Mattis. I forget I'm um, blanking on it, but he, he came from another, uh, you know, our defense contractor arms maker. And then so did Mark Esper, his other secretary of defense. So it's just it, that's become kind of a new thing that the person it's just so blatant now. The person running the military comes from that industry where there's such an interest in starting wars and funding proxy wars and, and all this stuff. And it's just not sustainable what the U.S. is trying to do right now. It is like the most classic case of concentrated benefits and dispersed costs that uh, The Economist could come across. It's so important because we see, you know, uh, the, the First World War, a little country of Serbia, you know, getting this whole thing uh, provoked between Russia and Austria and Germany and Britain and America. And then this little town, Danzig. Uh, starts a war between Poland and Germany and Britain and everything else. And now, again, we're back to these two little places, the Donbass and Taiwan. Not to say that they're little and they don't matter, but I don't think people appreciate the matches that, uh, th that the ruling class is playing with in the uh, sea of oil that uh, they find themselves in. So that's why I ask that uh, people check out antiwar.com. Of course, links to uh, Dave's writings will be in the description. Final question for you, sir. What is your message to members of the military, past and present? Well, 
so my message would be, you know, anybody in the military right now, I think people should, uh, I don't think people should be joining the military, especially now where we're standing on the precipice of potentially two major wars with Russia and China. And that uh, I think that's why movements like Defend the Guard, I think, are really important because they're trying to get the National Guard to not uh, have to be deployed to these uh, wars that aren't even declared. And, um, you know, we really need uh, to not give them people to send to these wars, to send to die uh, in these wars. And for past uh, people that were previously in the military, I mean, some, some of our strongest uh, friends and, and allies are, are veterans who have seen this stuff firsthand. And every veteran I know uh, ha have stories about just exorbitant waste. That's really the big one that you always hear. And of course, if they were involved in combat, they have horrific stories there or, um, you know, just about handing out money to, you know, uh, tribal leaders in Afghanistan and, and things like that, uh, that they should share with people and really tell people what it's about. And we have to stop glorifying it because, you know, the U it's very clear now. It's a lot clearer now, I think, that the government uh, doesn't have people in the military's interest at heart at all. So people should get out and, and shouldn't join. And um, I think it's clearer now more than ever that that's what people should be doing. I used to kind of be hesitant uh, really uh, to speak out about this because I know so many people that have joined the military and had thought they didn't have any other options and went there to get the GI Bill and stuff. But now it's like I think anti-recruitment activism and stuff is pretty important. And I think veterans can play a big role in that because if you hear it from some hippie, it's not going to sound as powerful as somebody who – did a few tours in Iraq or Afghanistan and, and saw what it was really like. So let's name those names so people can uh, check them out. I know Douglas McGregor is a big one. I know Peter Van Buren worked at the State Department. He's great on the amount of waste. Who are some other veterans that, uh, well, uh, those two alone, there's so much to read. You can be busy mm -hmm. for a year. Uh, who are some of the other veterans that uh, that, that come to mind? Well, Danny Serson is one of the best, and uh, he hasn't been writing recently, but if you just go to antiwar.com, I mean, he's written prolific, like prolifically about these issues kind of I'm talking about, and I was really thinking of a lot of his anecdotes when I was talking about the examples of waste. And uh, Matthew Ho, too, he's another good one. And um, Dan McKnight, who's leading the Defend the Guard movement thing, I think he's a really important voice. And I think he can really speak to a lot of more uh, people that who could be uh, leaning toward the military and stuff. And um, Yako yeah. Willink uh, was uh, was definitely uh, in the military, and he had uh, Scott Horton on his show. That's right. Recently. Yeah, that was uh, amazing. Jack Posobiec was a uh, naval, I think, psychological warfare officer, something in that uh, arena. And he's come out and said, Ron Paul was right about this. Mm -hmm. Libertarians are better than conservatives on foreign policy. So we're uh, we're getting a uh, a lot of people there. there. There's so many. Yeah, there um, is. I think not to so mention Ron Paul was in the Vietnam. Yeah, War. that's right. I always forget that. There, there's a lot to mention, and I uh, a lot of people that I could uh, that I will probably think of after we we talk here, and that I wish I mentioned, but. Yeah, there's definitely a lot. And I think, again, that some of the, our most valuable people are our veterans because they, they speak from experience. I mean, Tulsi Gabbard, she I had, she just came out and said that is, Islam, Islamic terrorism is like the number one threat to the world. She says a lot of stupid things about uh, the war on terror. She's really bad on that. But she was kind of the, you know, the anti-regime change war candidate in 2020. And it, it, it meant a lot coming from her because she was there in Iraq and stuff and saw it. Exactly. Yes. Uh, she She's really good sometimes. It <laughs> just throws us under the bus other times. Yeah. It goes to show you how what we need to depoliticize things as much as possible because the best politicians are still just like the worst people mm -hmm. ever. The yeah. website is <laughs> antiwar.com and libertarianinstitute.org. Dave DeCamp, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thanks for having me.